That's good. All right. Let's see. I hope this all works. It should. It's amazing how I, it's worked so far anyway. It's like a miracle every time. <laughs> okay, so we're live on oh. Facebook now. So hi, everyone. Yeah, I can, see it. It, can you see me? Just <laughs> okay, great. Hey, everyone, we're just getting ready. We have like three minutes before we go live on Revolution Radio with our special guest, Michael Lee Hill. I'm so excited. What a way to start off the new year uh, with Michael Lee Hill. And uh, we get to talk about some adventures that we have been on and some adventures that are coming to the future. Uh, you're going to want to uh, strap in because this is going to be a wild ride this evening. And um, it might change your life in some ways. Let's hope so for the good, of course. And because um, we're going to be giving you some new information that's going to rock your world for sure. So uh, just hang in there and uh, we'll be right with you. Um, we're going to be going live on Revolution Radio. And I'm still here on Revolution Radio. It's been six years, six years every Friday night. I just never thought I would do that in a million years, <laughs> that I would stay with something for six years, you know. And uh, But I'm here. Hi, Lynn. Oh, good to see you. Great to see you. Um, I just did a reading um, last week uh, for someone uh, from who saw me do readings here on the show. And I really love that because sometimes I forget to tell people that I, that's how I make my living. I do readings. I do psychic readings for people and healings. And I've been doing that for 30 years, you know. And so um, I have a degree of mastery with it. And I love doing it. So... Oh, hi, Stephen Myers. Yeah, Michaels is a wonderful guest. And so we're going to go live right now on Revolution Radio. Here we go now. So let's see what happens. Express them. They do not necessarily represent oh, the here. opinions of Revolution Radio and freedomslips.com, its staff or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener supported radio. And now we return you to your host. <laughs> Thank you for all. An internationally acclaimed psychic, spiritual healer, author, and founder of the online mystery school, Esoteric University. As the cosmic oracle, she is a conduit to the powers that be to answer your questions about your future self, past lives, current career, love. She shines light into the darkness to illuminate what was, what may be, and beyond. The readings and advice given by Barbara Jean Lindsay are for entertainment purposes only. Should not take the place of any medical, legal, or financial advice given to you by a qualified professional and are not a substitute for medical, legal, or financial advice. If you need a doctor, call a doctor. If you need to be expanded, call the cosmic oracle. Hello and welcome everyone. To, ooh, getting a little bit of sound back. Let me see if I can fix that right away. Hello and welcome everyone. Oh, we fixed that quickly. Uh, to the Cosmic Oracle Show. This is your host, Barbara Jean Lindsay, and it is Friday, January 22nd, 2021. Uh, you are listening to Revolution Radio. We're an all volunteer station. That means that no one gets paid. We just show up because we like, you know, we like what we do here. We get to talk about whatever we want to talk about, and we have a lot of freedom here. And uh, I've been doing it for six years, and I love doing it here and being one of the hosts on over 80 shows. And the way you can give to our um, Revolution Radio is you can go to freedomslips.com. That's freedomslips.com, and give whatever you can, $5, $10, to keep us on the air, keep the lights on, keep the computers going, and everything else that's brought to you is free. And know that every dollar that you give goes directly to the station itself, okay? So uh, I'm really excited. 
we have Michael Lee Hill with us today, and I'd like to give you an introduction to him. Oh gosh, I, I felt like I'd know him forever, okay, <laughs> when I first met him, but um, he is a phenomenal uh, guitarist, an award-winning guitarist, uh, a creator. He has a, a beautiful website, uh, michaelleehill.net, and where you can see his work that he's done with the 432 Hertz to heal our water. Um, and he has a lot of information for you there. He started uh, his, I think he's destined for fame. You can't run from it or hide from it sometimes, but because sometimes it's your destiny. And I think that's the truth with Michael Lee Hill here. Uh, he started just uh, seeing uh, UFOs down, down in his Lake Erie, down in his uh, community, just having some fun. And, and it ended up seeing uh, UFOs uh, consistently and then developing a relationship with those UFOs. Then he came into putting it online on uh, YouTube and getting over a million hits. And then he went on to uh, uh, a television show. We'll have, a, have to have Michael tell us which show I can't remember. And they uh, tested his blood and sure enough, he had a, a, a different kind of a blood anomaly that really, uh, started his journey with the whole Anunnaki. We could do a whole show on the Anunnaki and his Anunnaki bloodline. So, but tonight we're gonna focus on some new things. Uh, and you can talk a little bit about the Anunnaki if you want, Michael, and we'll take it from there. Welcome to the show, Michael Lee Hill. Uh, thanks, Barbara. <laughs> it's uh, a pleasure, as always. Well, I, you and I, I'm, and, and we got in trouble. We were talking about that earlier. In a good way, we had a, um, a, a beautiful journey, a sacred journey that we had developed with uh, the Mitchell Hedges uh, skull and where we took it to, um, where did we take it to? Your hometown, I think it was. Yeah, that's where I, you know, we'll have to get into all of this, but mm -hmm. you know, the Anunnaki, were known as the Elohim in the Bible. And, um, you know, it says right there, the Elohim created a, a hybrid bloodline with the daughters of man. And um, that is the Anunnaki human hybrid bloodline. And um, I tracked the bloodline into East Lake, Ohio, which was my hometown. You know, my mom worked for the city of East Lake. <laughs> And um, after I found out, because I didn't even know my uh, heritage, and as you said, I was brought, it was the UFO hunters. On the oh, UFO channel. hunters, okay. Yeah, they're the ones that brought me on, and they're the ones that did. They had a Harvard professor, his name was David Sistrom, who did my blood work, and they revealed I didn't have normal human blood. But um, I tracked this bloodline known as the Nephilim, is what they called it in the Bible. But uh, uh, a lot of people throw the Nephilim and the Anunnaki under the proverbial bus as being the ones that are behind all the world's secret societies and the skull and bones and the ones that they feel are keeping humanity oppressed. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to say no, mm -hmm. I can prove it. That's what I'm doing right now is enough of them came in and intertwined into the Mayan culture first and then left uh, the Yucatan and came into the North American, you know, Florida, actually, we can get into that, um, and became known as what is the Mount Builders. I think this is very important because, obviously, it's not the European secret societies. It's the oldest Nephilim bloodline that is my bloodline. comes in through uh, the mountain builders and intertwined into the Native American Indians. Mm -hmm. So East Lake, Ohio, what had happened was I had done my research. My mom was like, you know, there was an Indian mound up on the hill. I'm like, what? You know, sure enough, it that's true. And uh, you know it's true because you were there. We'll get into that. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I got a call from... I posted some things that I had found. I started working with the East Lake Historical Society, and um, I got newspapers in my possession. First of all, 
It's the same location as where I filmed all these UFOs over Lake Erie, and I found out the, U- the UFO activity, I've got newspaper articles from the 1800s, and they said these orbs of light would be out there, and they thought it was a trick, maybe there's a sh- on fire, and they'd send a rescue crew out, and nothing would ever be found, and they called them wizard lights. And uh, I think this is important because a lot of people go, well, what if they're ours? Well, it's not ours if it's in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. But um, so uh, so what happened was I had these newspaper articles. And not only that, I, I have newspaper articles that the mound builders were first in East Lake, Ohio. And also the, the Iroquois uh, and the Erie Montauk, which is... They're all Indian tribes, and they uh, were in East Lake, Ohio. So what happened was I got a a call from a guy from the Smithsonian, and he said, you know, I've noticed your work, and are you aware that there's still an intact ancient earthwork there in East Lake, Ohio? It's like, no. (laughs) You know, I, I was... I was raised there, you know, that's my hometown. No one knows that it's there. People think it was the garbage dump, by the way. (laughs) No, it's not a garbage dump. But um, that shows you how messed up things are. But he told me how to find it. And sure enough, uh, that's where we took the Mitchell Hedges uh, Mm -hmm. crystal skull just too recently. So you were there. Mm -hmm. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That main mound where... um, we had the ceremony and there's the olive tree, which yeah. is a big part of all of this story. Um, it takes over a mile to walk around it. Yep. It's huge, you know? So uh, there's a lot happening there with, um, I'm working with some different people who are involved with uh, ground penetrating radar Ooh. and uh, working to get them to come and be able to look at what's truly earth because it's unpilfered. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. since it's been forgotten and people didn't know what it was, Mm -hmm. all of its goodies are still there. But the guy from the Smithsonian told me, just so you know, uh, we did a really small excavation there, and we removed some artifacts that are in the East Lake Willoughby Indian Museum. Did you go to that trip with us? I did. I I have Uh, many, many photos of of those as well, of the historical... um, museum there and with the wonderful yeah. lady that i forget her name who was just uh, just a walking historical uh being it's herself like yes uh, her name is ann and uh, she she's been a uh a blessing and so much information but um yeah he's the one the guy from the smithsonian said some of these artifacts that tie this east lake ohio ancient mound builder site to sumer to the Anunnaki um, is in this museum. And sure enough, as you've seen, there's an artifact, uh, a slate tablet that has the morning star, mm-hmm. which is kind of like the four pointed, um, something like a compass or a four pointed star. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on the, the tablet. And that's the morning star is actually in where, getting ahead of myself, but <laughs> Bloodline originally entered Florida. In Crystal River specifically, oh. and just Crystal River is where they just recently found a uh, Mayan step pyramid. So, uh, and that's been captured on ground penetrating radar. And it's big, you know. So the bloodline entered Florida and then came up the top left hand side of Florida, and um, known as the Mount Builders. Uh, but there's three actual migrations and the, the most third route took them up around the Great Lakes area all the way up there mm-hmm. and um, that's East Lake Ohio and um, so uh, yeah wow and so I, and I know when we walked on the mound there at East Lake it's in a park there and people are walking on this sacred property the sacred land and they are not even aware of it no one's aware of it that's the thing that kind of blew my mind we went there to have ceremony but you know most people didn't even know it existed there and still don't they have no clue you know i just uh last year i 
talk with the mayor of East Lake. He's like, oh, I just thought that was a garbage dump. Right. <laughs> like, right. So you're going to be changing uh, all of that, right? That or that's already changed. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to this. Uh, yeah, it'll be recognized in the near future. Mm -hmm. It's the home of the Atlanteans. You know, this is the the bloodline that was here in uh, Crystal River, Florida. There is an archaeological state-owned park, and it's a Mayan complex, and it's called Crystal River Archaeological Site. People can Google it. Okay. Um, but in the museum, as you walk out the door, the back of the museum, there was a floor de lis on huh. the back window i'm like is it why isn't anyone asking what does the fleur de lis have to do with native american indian culture because people associate it with france and right. royalty and, right. uh, um no you know go back to a picture of inky from sumer where he's holding the pine cone look at the helmet man he's got a fleur de lis on his helmet isn't that something what? But, um, what i can tell you is you know, me and Sarah were just watching the movie The Da Vinci Code mm -hmm. with Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. and obviously a famous book. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they start explaining what the Fleur de Lis is and said it was the uh, a symbol of the bloodline of those of royal blood. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, if you type in Anunnaki, you'll find out the true meaning people know is those from heaven who come to earth or some variation of that mm -hmm. but a deeper meaning of the word anunnaki is those of royal blood so oh. the anunnaki and the floor de lee are interchangeable well, um you know i can tell you too when i received my name by the native american indian elders um, rainbow warrior eagle um the floor de lee was brought up in a very significant way mm -hmm. and uh they i'm talking about the anunnaki themselves consider that their bloodline mm -hmm. of the hybrid bloodline on this planet so uh yeah it's really important and i'm so glad and all this has been filmed by the way you met lucas <laughs> and, i uh, did i did um so not only that, you know all of this has been documented in an unbelievable fashion i mean he's using drone he's using 4k stabilized footage it's just glorious what he's doing but we're working on a documentary um that i'm with footage of gonna be releasing all of this but what's cool is uh fringe tv which is a new kind of like gaia but it's um it's uh from rick and linda smith the organizers oh, yeah. of um Human Origins mm -hmm. Conference, mm -hmm. um, which I'm going to be part of that in March as well. I'm mm -hmm. really excited. But they started uh, this new um, channel, and it's on Roku right now. It's called Fringe TV. Mm -hmm. And I've been given just uh, an open canvas to give them content. And um, so I'm going to be doing a documentary first, and then a whole series where I'm going to be releasing everything I've learned from the Anunnaki. You know, their counsel to me into cosmic harmonious frequencies, which actually just, you know, led to NASA looking into my work. And they they found it's bringing in energy from another dimension. And uh, that's funny because what they found in a droplet of water is we've almost killed our tap water by putting chlorine and fluoride and making it mm -hmm. take right angle turns and so on and so forth. But, um... Uh, so under NASA's photography, it's kind of like people know what carrying photography is, but mm -hmm. they can actually photograph the um, amount of photonic energy within a droplet of water. So they tested California tap water, and it's almost dead. It just looks like this tiny pinprick mm -hmm. of light. And um, and then after 15 minutes of just sitting on one of my 432 discs and like you said anyone could just go to michaelleehill.net and you can see pictures of these discs there's one there i actually have one for those on facebook they can see it ah, yeah right on, yeah um so uh after 15 minutes on that disc it looked like a supernova had exploded within the droplet of water so i asked the biophysicist i said well wait a minute 
if there's no energy, but then there's a lot of energy, isn't that some, some form of unlimited free energy? I said, where's that extra energy coming from? Is it coming from our realm? Is it coming from our sun? Is it coming from our planets? You know, electromagnetic fields. And she said, no. She said, it's coming from another dimension. And I thought, wow. Well, that's pretty freaking weird, you know. <laughs> I never, I never had to ask myself, what does it mean to be drinking water that contains energy from another dimension? Right, right. And and NASA is saying this, not just you know anybody, no, right? Yeah, this was NASA. You know what happened was um, Richard Hoagland, you know the famous mm -hmm. Richard Hoagland. Mm -hmm. He was um, NASA's liaison to the public. He was Walter Cronkite science advisor and for people that don't know who he is he was the one that through nasa found that there was a face on mars and released that yeah. to the world and um so he was a big part of my enlightenment was when i had questions spirit led me to richard hoagland so recently when he contacted me and said he'd like to have me on his show i was i was kind of starstruck you know, like, Holy <laughs> yeah God. but um in that interview, he said, you know, we know your story sounds pretty crazy to the common person, but NASA, he said, has been looking into how energy works multidimensionally, and all the numbers you're bringing to the table are right on the money. Hmm. So NASA would like to look into your work and we'll arrange it. Hmm. And he did. So, yeah, this is as legit as you can get. <laughs> and I have all the... Um, all the scientific data, all the photography, because not only do they do tap water, California tap water, municipal tap water, mm -hmm. they did, you know, six photographs at untreated control. Then they did six more photographs at 15 minutes, then another six photographs at a half hour, and then another six photographs at 50 minutes. And they said what they found, because People know there's a lot of ways to restructure water. You can vortex it, you can spin it, you can put it through high magnetic fields they found. Or there's some people that are powerful enough healers that they can restructure water by a blessing. Oh, I love that. So they can just give it love. Huh. But in all of those instances, they said, yeah, you, you can physically see that in the, within the water droplet, it's regained its energy. But the longer you leave it, it said that the periphery of the light pattern actually gets bigger and brighter, but it's more diffuse. They said mm -hmm. for the first time ever, when they looked into my technology, what it's doing to water, they said the longer they kept it on the disc, that it was turning the light within the water droplet into a laser beam of energy. He said, instead of getting more diffuse, it was getting smaller and tighter and more focused. Hmm. He said, it was almost like, a, you know, if you had a, a magnifying glass and you're going to burn a leaf. And as you move it up the magnifying glass, you see the light periphery gets smaller and smaller mm -hmm. until it gets so powerful it can burn the leaf and hmm. ignite it. Well, they said that's what they were finding with what this technology is weird because when I first met the Anunnaki back in 2008, I'm talking in person, not, you know, nothing against channeling or anything. I'm all for it, but this was not that. This is third dimension. Three, yeah, 3D, <laughs> like me just talking to someone. They said, in your past, we were once known as the Anunnaki. And you were once known as Ia Inky, the water bearer. Right. Well, there was no ancient aliens on TV. I didn't know what an Anunnaki was. I surely didn't know what an Inky was, and I didn't know what the water bearer was all about. But now, with the technology, and one thing I do want to make clear, this was being tutored using crop circles. Mm. It's almost like a chalkboard in a classroom by the Anunnaki and myself. And once they started guiding me into understanding these principles, I would ask them a question, and the answer would show up in a crop circle the next day. That's just and wild. That was kind of freaky. You know? <laughs> I was like, oh, wait a minute. Um, but yeah, uh, so being guided into this most cosmic harmonious frequency of 432 hertz, um, that's what made me hire scientists to image my guitar recorded in my recording studio. And I was meticulous about making sure it was tuned properly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So, uh, yeah, I would have never thought in a million years NASA would get, get involved. But I can share one thing that really flipped me out from Richard Hoagland and mm -hmm. NASA. said so these 432 base numbers are already encoded their processional cycle numbers. And the procession of the equinox, you know? Mm -hmm. um, the exit, when I met the Anunnaki in 2008, they said the normal succession of kingship and how they related to mankind was all based on the processional cycle. And that's why it was so important to the ancients to track the entry into the age of Aquarius. Because mm -hmm. you know the whole prophecy of the age of Aquarius where mankind is going to enter a new golden age right. and be freed from the tyranny and um, so here we are and you're playing a major role in this a major part in this and you've been kind of like acclimated since 2008 you're just minding your own business right and so yeah, for yeah. the last like 13 <laughs> years you're like a totally different person than than yeah. where you started and it's like um you know what I just mm -hmm. told Sarah, you're absolutely right i feel like a forest gump of all of this <laughs> right. you know it's just stuff happens i'm like oh all right that's kind of weird but I, Sarah, I said you know what i've come to understand is you know my work we can get into the canadian mm -hmm. government and uh, okay you know th that work but um everything that's been happening it's like i'm not doing it you know, right. it's like someone else is moving the chess pieces. So I said, you know what? I'll, I'm going to stop trying to accomplish anything. <laughs> I'm just going to sit back Show and, up. and engage. I'm going to be in observer mode. And uh, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be following my bliss and doing what cause I'm really drawn right now to really dive back into music mm -hmm. more so than anything. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of media things. Uh, for a matter of fact, you know, a team was filming at the Serpent Mound, mm -hmm. and they, uh, they're they filming Ross... Uh, oh, yeah. Hamilton? Yes, so, Ross Hamilton, uh, yes. Yeah, and um, so my name kept coming up in circles because of my, you know, work with Chief and being, you know, at the Serpent Mound events. So this was probably five or six years ago. Uh, they came and interviewed me at my house. And by the way, they said that they captured something paranormal. Mm -hmm. As we were filming, something that was not truly physical flew through the living room. Huh. And it was very fast. And it, it kind of felt like wings. Like you felt oh, the air off of nice, whatever it was. But nice. then a bunch of shit, paintings and shit fell off the walls in my huh. living room. Huh. And uh, they said that they got that on film of curious to see it but the point is i just got contacted by them and say they told me we just got the green light uh we got an emmy award winning producer that is putting it together and there's many mainstream networks that uh are wanting to pick it up mm -hmm. and um so uh they sent me a contract and i said well I forgot what it was even on, but yeah, this was you. So I'm like, oh, by the way, what what was this on? They're like, oh, some mound builders. I was like, <laughs> well, wait a minute, we got some more to your story to talk about. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And 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 you work with the chief, and and how, how did you meet Lauren? How did you meet? Uh, I I've never asked you that. I always wanted to ask you that question. I always forget. It's a very fascinating because up until the History Channel show. I never knew my heritage or my nationality. I was adopted. Mm -hmm. So most people are like, dude, you're Italian. Like, look at <laughs> like, oh, all right, whatever. Um, but uh, when they found this blood anomaly, the Harvard professor said, listen, we know you're adopted. If you can contact your biological uh, parents, you probably should to see if this is something hereditary. You know, it's because we can get into, well, we, we got into it last time. Mm -hmm. but there's a, a, a specific anomaly re regarding creatine kinase in the blood, and they right. found just massive off the charts amounts of it in my blood that's not normal. Yep. And creatine kinase brings oxygen up. It's actually uh, like electricity, um, electrical capacitor inside a cellular level. You could look at it as chi or prana or life mm -hmm. force or whatever you want to, uh, the force, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
I got to share a story real quick. You know Clifford Mahuti? Yes. The Zuni elder. Yes. Me and him were roomies at one of the, uh, the Star Knowledge conferences. Mm-hmm. And during it, uh, he had just seen the new Star Wars movie. And he was so excited about it. Mm-hmm. He's like, does any of you have your uh, Jedi name yet? <laughs> he didn't know, like, growing up, the band I was in, one of my best friends growing up, his name was Mike Crow, and I was called him Crow B. Juan Kenobi, <laughs> he, he would call me Hill B. Juan Kenobi, oh, so, oh, he oh. us a video of us had our, had our uh, Jedi name, I looked at him and said, yes, I do, it's Hill B. Juan Kenobi, and he just looked at me really strangely, so at one point, we were just all going to head out to the porch. And um, I'm like, hey, Clifford, do you want to join us out here? And he's like, yes, let me grab my translator. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to share that story. <laughs> so, yes, I'm, I am Hilby Juan Kenobi. That's Both awesome. The force. <laughs> I love it. I love but, uh, it. Man, did I just spin out? We were talking about something totally different. Yeah, it- oh, yeah, and I we do have a question from one of the listeners. Loretta mm-hmm. Vigil asked, what is Michael's haplo group? Oh, good question. It's mm-hmm. X2A. Which, I mean, that's a big part of the actual DNA. Um, you know, haplogroup X2A was only found in 1998. Mm-hmm. And the big deal about it is it's only found right now in like around 3% of the Native American Indian culture. But it could be much higher because the truth of the matter is not many Native American Indian First Nation people have had their blood work done. Mm-hmm. So it could be much higher. But when you go back in time, uh, Haplogroup X2A was found in the tall skeletons, the uh, giants. Mm-hmm. I'm, doing, I'm doing quotes even though you can't. Do quote fingers, giants. <laughs> um, and... Uh, so those tall skeletal remains they know are haplogroup X2A. But when you go back in time, where you find the largest concentration of that haplogroup, it's going to tell you where it came from, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, well, it happens to be the hills of Galilee. This is the lost tribe of Israel. Oh, and if you yeah. remember, that's what uh, the lady... The yes, and Yes. ...said, because it's really weird. I've never been... Like... I'm not attached. religious in any normal <laughs> way, but I'm finding out the, the Mormon religion. I was told by the NSA remote viewers group, the reverse engineering, they said, uh, if you look at the Book of Mormon, not as a religious text, but as the most accurate history book, it's not been messed with by the Vatican, that's more accurate. Hmm. And it tells in... The, the Book of Mormon, they call the Nephilim, the Nephi. Mm. And um, it's very interesting because the f- person that wrote the first four chapters of the Book of Mormon, his name was Lehi. And Lehi mm. was a member of the Nephi, or the Nephilim. <laughs> and when he took the bloodline from the hills of Galilee, uh, Mormon research has showed that it came to Crystal River, Florida. So it's all it's all coming. That together, is right? just so wild. I I know I remember you mentioning with Anne at the museum that they have the Mormon uh, come there to learn about their uh, religion from that museum. Yeah, because what had happened was um, Joseph Smith, you know, who the main person that brought forth the Book of Mormon, the first temple he ever built with his own two hands is in Kirtland, Ohio, where we went for that overlook, Mm. uh, Skywatch. Right. And um, so uh, the Mormons send Mormon people from all over the planet to visit that first Mormon temple. And um, so as you heard Anne say, what was really strange is they also tell the people coming to see that first Mormon temple but you can type in Mormon Temple, Kirtland, Ohio, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's, a, it's a mecca for Mormons to visit there from all over the world because it was the first. But um, as you heard Ann say, uh, the Mormons also say if you want to see actual artifacts from the Lost Tribe of Israel to uh, go to that museum. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I gotta share another story. Maybe okay, I love it. Feet, probably, but um, I there's a knock on my door when I was living there, and I opened up the door and there's this little boy. He was only, man, he was only about a yardstick high, and he <laughs> had a big winter coat on, and uh, I'm looking and there's no one else around. I'm looking down the street. There's no parents or. And I'm like, hello. And he's like, I just wanted to say hello. And I said, he looked at me and said, hello. I said, hello. He said, there you have it. He turned around and walked away. Oh, my gosh. What and the so heck? I, I, I still to this day love that little, there you have it. That <laughs> <laughs> was one of the weirdest, like, I was like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> <laughs> That is just wild. That is just, I mean, your whole life it's been pretty wild, Michael, okay? I mean, yeah. you're, you're handling it, I have to say, from pretty well, considering, you know, were there times where you thought you were just like probably so on the edge you were going to lose it, but somehow you were able to, to keep it together, you know, and and keep going forward with, with uh and then the, the synchronicity of things, just one thing after another after another for you to yeah. to keep you on this, really a destiny more than than <laughs> anything. It's something about synchronicity. It, mm -hmm. it's, this is true for all of us. Mm -hmm. said, imagine one night that you meet the creator, you meet source, and uh, she uh, gives you a flower to symbolize your meeting. And in this meeting, you realize we're all taken care of, everything is unfolding perfectly, mm -hmm. and we're loved beyond what we could ever even imagine. And this feeling of well-being and bliss just comes over you, mm -hmm. and uh, she hands you this flower. And then you go drift off back to sleep, but this is like a revelation. It's a lucid dream, mm -hmm. a vision. And then when you wake up in the morning, you go to get up, and you see that there's a real, real rose flower. on your chest. Then what? That's oh. the question question mark because what they told me is the more the, when you start to pay attention to life synchronicities they'll grow mm. and they will grow to the point that all doubt is removed that something is in communication with you and it'll it'll grow to the point of awaking with a rose on your chest oh, and it has yeah. like um in many ways in my life the synchronicities have grown to the point that, well, asking for scientific information, they come in in a crop circle. Which, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's just one instance. I, I'll give you another one. Just okay. So you know. Um, uh, I had the weirdest dream, vision. And I can tell when these are not normal dreams, they become mm -hmm. very lucid, very real, and they have a different texture to them. It's like super real reality. And in it, I was let down this corridor, and it emptied out into a club, but it was empty. And I seen one of my musical idols, his name is Steve Vai, Ooh. and he was performing on stage. He took a sound check, really. He was like, I need a little bit more trouble on my guitar or whatever. And he starts doing a song called There's a Train That's Leaving. And um, he, uh, the song I remember in the vision was very spiritual. You know, it's like there's there's a, a fork in the road coming up and there's a train that's leaving. And he started, like, he was levitating. And he floated right over to me where me and this guide was. And this big crescendo of a song like da -da 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 da he goes welcome aboard <laughs> but when he said welcome aboard it was like one of those cosmic I hate to say god voices but it was it was like a multi-dimensional voice saying welcome aboard <laughs> it woke me up out of the dream <laughs> and I, uh, I thought well you know WTF <laughs> you know what the hell was that about and matter of fact I've named a drawer in my mind it's the WTF drawer. <laughs> so this weird shit happens, I just keep throwing more shit in the WTF drawer. But the next day, I had this feeling like, man, there's I, I just felt that there was some kind of synchronicity waiting for me at mm. Steve Vai's website. And I thought, wouldn't it be weird if he 
was actually working on a song called There's a Train That's Leaving, you know? Mm-hmm. So I went to his website, and the first thing I seen was this banner, and it said, Enter the Steve I. Ibanez Guitar Challenge. And the fur went up on the back of my neck, man. I knew I was going to win that contest. It was nationwide. Um, I knew I was going to win it, and I hadn't even recorded a note yet. Huh. I was like, well, I just met him last night in a vision, and he said, welcome aboard. You know, I'm pretty sure I, I'm going to win this. Sure enough, I, I did end up winning it. But uh, that's a weird spiritual story in itself, though, because you had to download. By the way, this is the year 2001, mm. and uh, I really didn't have much skill into even using a computer. And at that, well, I can tell you, you had the, he had taken one of his songs and stripped all the guitar parts off of it, uh, down to just drums and bass. And the contest was, you had to re-record all the guitar parts yourself, but make it your own. They weren't looking for a copycat performance of what he did. And then he would listen to them and he would choose whichever one he thought was the most creative. So, uh, there was, you'd stream the mp3 file well back then you know how slow modems were and everything it wouldn't even play it was like breaking up and I'm like how, how am i supposed to play over this mm-hmm. it's impossible you know so you know how we do sometimes i'm like maybe this is just a sign from spirit that uh this isn't for me and don't give your energy away to illusionary outside sources mm-hmm. um and uh so i just tried to let it go but one night I was laying in bed, and it was probably about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm like, WTF, you know? <laughs> what is wrong with me being able to record over that track? I just want to play over it. Screw the contest. I just, you know, I'm a mm-hmm. big Steve Vai fan. I would love to be able to play over that. And this voice is in my head says, well, get up and go into your studio and record it. I'm like, how about screw you? <laughs> me and my higher <laughs> self have this this is our relationship. I'm like, right. I've been trying to do this for uh, two weeks, and uh, I'm not getting out of bed. It's one o'clock in the morning, and I'm going to sleep. And the voice said, "Then you, then you've learned nothing." Ooh. So I got up, and, and right when I went into the room, I thought, "Well, I got to do something different than I did for the last two weeks." So at that time, I had no clue on a mouse. Like now, everyone knows if you right mouse click, it'll say save file as you know but i didn't even know this at the time i didn't know there was another menu if you right click it so right when i clicked it and it said save file as i was like oh my god yes so my modem was so slow it took about an hour of it downloading <laughs> but while it was downloading i fired up my amp and got it mic'd up in my studio as soon as it downloaded i recorded i, I realized oh my god this riff that i wrote seems like it would work over the song perfectly mm. and i tried it and it fit like a glove so i'm like well crap i'm just gonna <laughs> blow some solos over this and see what it sounds like well i did and really one take through what um i got done and i was like well that's it that's my entry <laughs> and i sent it in the same night i didn't even work on it anymore that same night that all of this happened and sure enough i won Ah. And that was weird, you know. I've met some of my heroes like Joe Santriani. Steve oh, I, Joe Henry. Santriani. Um, I love Joe Santriani. Oh, uh, yeah, he's the coolest <laughs> dude. Um, um, it's been, you know, I don't know. I've been blessed by meeting some of my heroes. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. I, uh, that's, by the way, so I ended up winning the Vi contest. And part of it is I get a private tutoring lesson from him. He's going to give me one of his own private guitars. What? And, um, yeah, I still, I mean, obviously I have it here. It's funny, I go, Steve, I'm just going to put this under my bed. I'm never going to play it. He's like, no, I think it's made to be played. You play it. So I play the shit out of it. <laughs> but um, anyhow, uh, it ends up, Joe Satriani had, had organized what he calls the G3 concerts. Mm. And what it is is the top three guitarists in the world, so to speak. And um, so all of a sudden I find out they're flying me to a G3 show. What? Yeah, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to get to the Joe Oh well. my God. Oh, Were you nervous? So, uh, Were you nervous? 
Oh, yeah. I was super <laughs> nervous. But you know what was really weird is they got me, they flew me to, to Detroit mm-hmm. to where the G3 show was happening. And they got me there at noon. And Joe Cetriani, um, nor Steve Vai, they didn't get there until about 5 o'clock. Mm. Um, you know, they were off doing press and whatnot. So they got me there at noon, and they gave me a backstage pass, all access, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I had nothing to do. I could go anywhere I wanted. And I was just by myself backstage. <laughs> I'm like, this is freaking weird. <laughs> you know, so I had some time for it to wear off. But um, one interesting thing I do want to share is mm-hmm. during that, you know, uh, one of the most respected bass players in the world is – Billy Sheehan, mm. and um, Billy Sheehan was part of the David Lee Roth band. When David Lee oh. Roth quit Van Halen, and mm-hmm. he made that album called Eat Him and Smile. It was Steve Vai on guitar and Billy Sheehan on bass. Huh. And then Billy Sheehan went to form his own band called Mr. Big, huh. and they had that number one hit song, I'm the One Who Bun- I'm the One Who Wants to Be With You, Deep huh. Inside. I'd sing it for you, but I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, uh, you know, most of the bands that has really, he's been uh, the common denominator for a lot of bands that have just really inspired me to be mm. a musician. So it just so happens on, the, on this tour that I was being flown to at the G3 show, Billy Sheehan was playing bass for Steve I oh. again. So... You know, I had nothing to do for hours, so I I, I hit the cafeteria quite often. You know? <laughs> and, um, so as I'm there and making a sandwich, Billy Sheehan walks right up next to me. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Billy Sheehan. You know what I mean? Right, so right. Because uh, I was in Steve I's dressing room, and Billy Sheehan comes in, and they start talking about touring with David Lee Roth. Huh. And it was so weird just to be a fly on the wall, you know, <laughs> two talking. I'll share, I'm going to share what he said in here. He goes, Billy Sheehan says to Steve I, you know, that's the only tour with David Lee Roth that I've ever wore ear protection. And it was specifically mm. because of your guitar amp. Huh. He said it was so loud that I, I couldn't even believe it. And he's like, that was David Lee Roth. He, he wanted it louder. Whoa. Like, don't go any louder. <laughs> so Eddie Van Halen must be a really loud player. Oh. But um, it was funny because, uh, um, yeah, Steve was like, that uh, he wanted it even louder. But I can tell you, that album was a huge inspiration to me. Mm. And But you got to know, I'm totally self-taught. I don't even, I have to really think about the names of the strings. Oh, that's so good, good to uh, hear. That's so good to hear. I know Grant Cameron did a whole thing on that, right, in his book. And and it said that most of the most brilliant guitarists and artists, they they play by ear or they're self-taught, that they don't know how to read music at all. The yeah, right, the right brain. About, by the way. Oh, so yeah? Grant contacted me and all the stuff that's on 432 and the uh, book came from me. It's like, Michael, I want you to teach me all about this 432 (laughs) stuff, but talk like you're talking to a kindergartner. (laughs) Perfect. But yeah, anyhow, so I get there, and um, I'm excited because I'm going to get to meet Joe Satriani, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it never happened, because by the time Steve I was in the house, and they took me back to the dressing room, uh, Joe Satriani wasn't there yet. Uh. So um, I'm like, well, it is what it is. But after the show, I'm standing on the side of the stage, and out comes Joe Satriani. But he had his little boy with him. Oh. And believe me, I wanted to go and just grab him. Joe, I'm the biggest <laughs> fan. But I could tell him and his son were having a moment, you know? Like, uh-huh. I was like, you know, I'd be the biggest dick if I went and interrupted <laughs> So I didn't. But I've had this thing in my life. Anytime I'm really excited for something mm-hmm. and it doesn't happen, I, I'm like to the universe, well, you got your work cut out for you because now you have to replace this with something even better. Oh, I um, like that. So I, but what happened was, you know, uh, after winning the Vi contest, I was offered an endorsement deal for Joe Satriani amplifiers made by <laughs> PV. And they had sent me to the NAM show. And um, at the time, I was working with David Sarita 
And it turns out Joe Satriani is a fan, a uh, fan of David Sarita's work with you know Dan Aykroyd, UFOs yeah. Unplugged, mm-hmm. and the case for NASA UFOs. So, uh, make a long story short, he's like, "Well, we're doing a documentary. Do you want to be part of it?" <laughs> and um, Joe Satriani's like, "Sure, meet me in the press tent over there." And we went over there. So I end up holding the shot, shotgun microphone <laughs> for our segment. I'm like, again, just pinching myself, going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> just, I'm not, you know, so me and Joe has become friends. And what's really uh... interesting is the whole point of all of this is, you know, Billy Sheehan being my favorite, one of my favorite musicians of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, we're now collaborating on one of my songs, and he's laying down a bass crack on it. What? And not only that, um, Dan Reed from the Dan Reed Network, uh... he opened up. 60 shows for the Rolling Stones. It was another huge inspiration. He's uh, writing, you know, the singing. He's, he's going to sing over it. Oh. So that's underway right now. Matter of fact, you know what? I was going to give you a rough demo oh. of that track, but obviously this, I will anyhow. Okay. And I was going to do it for the show, but it didn't happen. Okay. So, yeah, that I would say that happening and, you know, uh, the disappointment with not meeting Joe Satriani came to fruition. <laughs> you know? Right, in a huge way. Yeah, now I got his half stack in the room back there that I was <laughs> given as an endorsement deal. It's, yeah, it's been a trip, you know. Um, but you, you really you know, trusted. You really trust. That's, that's what I hear you saying. If we can just trust in this, right? We can trust in this force of this energy or this um, relationship that's there to to serve you, to prod you, to help you, to, yeah. you know? You know, the biggest thing is in the in that Star Wars movie where, you know, Yoda brings the ship up out of the swamp mm-hmm. and Luke's like, I don't believe it. And Yoda says, that's why you fail. You know, we need to temper that inner dialogue, that voice that... It comes from the mass consciousness, by the way. I heard the first 15 seconds, we think it's our own voice because it's in our own voice in our own head. Mm -hmm. But we're not really thinking, we're listening. And right now, the mass consciousness is filled with a lot of fear and doubt. So if you don't train yourself to... So what I'm telling you, you can do all the spiritual homework you want Mm -hmm. and clear your own belief system of lower vibrational thought forms, negative thought forms, but guess what? You're still part of the mass consciousness. And especially if you go into a, a, a room that's filled with negative people, you'll, your first thought forms are going to begin being, oh, I'm getting screwed again. Why is this happening to me mm-hmm. again? Mm-hmm. You know? And um, to me, I was, once I started understanding thoughts creating reality, I started to realize well, shit, why is my internal dialogue still negative? Am I just screwed? You know, I have to my own bullshit for the rest of my life. And I really, I went to uh, the big woman upstairs. And I said, I need some understanding because I can't stop mm-hmm. the uh, that voice. And all of a sudden, I got this download. And what it was, was one of those old-time like RCA record players that have the big horn needle that would drop down on the album. And said it's just a recording, but with that recording, that message it was so multidimensional, and I understood that there's an infinite amount of probable parallel realities, from the darkest of the dark to the lightest of the light. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's no end to the bottom when we want to f- start to fall, and there's no high to the top when we start to climb. Mm-hmm. Everything is available, but there's one negative thought form that you do have a fear stamp on. And there's probably a lot worse, but you don't really believe it. But if it falls in line with some stuff that fits in with, oh, this happened before, you can start to go, why is this happening again? Well, if you don't find some other, like to me, right when I understood that voice of doubt, Mm-hmm. It's just a recording. What else is available? Mm-hmm. That then severs the connection to the mass consciousness, which doesn't always need to be severed. Right. You know, if your person there, peace, love, and good happiness stuff, mm-hmm. then by all means, fly with it. But if it's, uh, who is me? You know, mm-hmm. then, and I found out Bruce Lee had this exact 
understanding, when he would have a, a thought form of fear and doubt, he would write it down on a piece of paper and then burn it. Ooh, I like that. Give, give it back give it back to the universe. Huh? All right, thank you for showing me where I have a fear stamp. Now what else is available? <laughs> so I can tell you, each one of us, you know, if either one of these methods work for you, then hallelujah. But mm -hmm. you can find your own way of understanding it as well. But what I was told is the first 15 seconds comes from the mass consciousness. If you can hold off, and because if you don't find another thought form, you'll own those first thought forms. That 15 seconds. Know? Yeah, like uh, never argue for your limitations, you know, because you'll own them. Mm -hmm. So... If you don't find, uh, and what I was told too, everyone talks about free will, but man, if there's an infinite amount of probable realities, but there's one reality that has the most love-filled outcome for everyone involved, what does that have to do with free will? Nothing. Mm. The only free will you have is to experience the, the illusion, the mayo, the darkness, to one degree or another. It might just be a slight deviation home. But, um, yeah, these are important things I've learned along the way. And, uh, but yeah, after 15 seconds, then if you don't, if you just accept the first thought forms and don't find what else is available, then you'll own it. But if you start looking for what else is available, a whole nother layer mm. of guidance will come. It's not from the mass consciousness. Oh, I like it's that. It's from higher bio mind or soul groupings or whatever you want to call it um so there you have it <laughs> there you have it that's gonna be our thing i'm gonna always think of that little boy at your door <laughs> and 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 what who was that little boy really right <laughs> yeah, i have no clue because i was uh, you know he walked away i still didn't see wherever he went to there was no adults anywhere i watched him walk away down the road and Huh. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, we're almost ready for a break already. And so I'm going to, yeah, yeah. So at the top, time, we, time flies, time's, right? <laughs> well, time's fun when you're having fun. We're having fun. I'm sure everyone is. <laughs> that we had a few, we just, um, we have a couple comments um, on, on what's been said so far. Um, and I'll just, uh, add those real quick. Uh, Loretta says X2A was claimed by the Mormons, I believe, as an attempt to attach themselves to the origins of the Native Americans. That's true. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I'm saying. You know, I'm not Mormon, and I'm, actually, all this is in the, the Bible as well. You know, uh, the Elohim, you know, the, the lost tribes, all of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's so weird because it is a feather in their cap. And I, uh, I'm not Mormon. I still haven't. I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should read the Book of Mormon to see what's being communicated. <laughs> this is, seems to be. Um, but more, I, I heard it's not, you know, the angel uh, Moroni. Uh, I heard it's not actually a name. It's, you know, have you ever heard of the, the people called the Mori? I have not. They're a group of people. I forget where they're at. It's kind of like Bosque. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the Bosque have a, a unique heritage. Mm -hmm. Well, the Mori said that they were actually from Atlantis. Ooh. So a lot of Mormons think Mori isn't a name. It's like saying I'm American. Huh. You're saying I'm Atlantean, Mori, Moroni. But Moroni is another incarnation of myself because uh, what I found out is I was in, you know, I'm Seneca. And mm -hmm. in Seneca, there's a person named the Peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And the Peacemaker has a story of the uh, Tree of Life. Okay, we'll be right back. Hold that. We're going to hear that story of the Tree of Life, the Peacemaker, right after this break. So don't go anywhere, Michael, and, and mute yourself, and we'll be back at four minutes after the hour, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Love having you on. I'm glad everybody's here. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this break.
Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. Wadiya will remain a dictatorship. Be quiet. Why are you guys so anti-dictators? Imagine if America was a dictatorship. You could let 1% of the people have all the nation's wealth. You could help your rich friends get richer by cutting their taxes and bailing them out when they gamble and lose. You could ignore the needs of the poor for healthcare and education. Your media would appear free, but would secretly be controlled by one person and his family. You could wiretap phones. You could torture foreign prisoners. You could have rigged elections. You could lie about why you go to war. You could fill your prisons with one particular racial group, and no one would complain. You could use the media to scare the people into supporting policies that are against their interests. Tune in Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time for Liberation Nation with Deacon John, where America comes to hear the truth. I know this is hard for you Americans to imagine, but please try. So politics will be on from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Studio A. Mark Steyer will have guests on that will discuss many important topics, including the state of the world today. However, much of the show will be dedicated to the writings of Edward Albert Meyer. I'm going to read a short passage from one of his writings. Love is the highest principle of creation, and through it, everything exists in absolute logic. All of nature in its indescribable splendor is nothing but the love of creation, which is expressed visibly. The love of creation is everywhere, because without it, nothing at all would be able to exist. Please join Mark on Ohio Exopolitics from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Studio A. secret that the so-called mainstream media is best described as controlled propaganda. Countless news stories are either totally ignored or spun with half-truths, and because of this, essential facts and vital information are often compromised. Join Dr. Ott every Friday night on Studio B at 10 p.m. Eastern and learn why the story behind the story was nominated for a Peabody Award in its second year of producing unparalleled broadcasting excellence in 1997. That is, if you really care about learning the truth. Transcending time and space, let us take you to the place inside your mind where thoughts divide and mysteries unwind. Join us every Monday evening right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And you will catch the Fenton Perspective with our great host, Lorian Fenton. Come listen in as she shares her amazing stories from the past to present, along with all of her guest secrets to the future. That's the Fenton Perspective every Monday evening right here from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Revolution Radio. Oh, and uh, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. Opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. <laughs> Hello and 
welcome back Hello. to the Cosmic Oracle Show. This is your host, Barbara Jean Lindsay, and we're here with part two with Michael Lee Hill. And we want to thank you for uh, allowing uh, us to have the Cosmic Oracle Show on the air right now, right this moment, live with Michael Lee Hill. And we can only do that with your help. And so if you could go to freedomslips.com, that's freedomslips.com, give whatever you can, a dollar, five dollars, hit that donate button and, and just give whatever you can. And we really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to give you a thank you in advance for keeping us on the air. And we're celebrating my sixth year as the Cosmic Oracle and the Cosmic Oracle show here. And so, uh, and it goes all over the world. And so I'm really happy to be a part of this and of this beautiful station here and all of our friends and family on Revolution Radio. And I really want to welcome Michael Lee Hill back. I mean, we we just got started there. You have such an amazing life and you're just getting started in a way, Michael, that I mean, the stories, you know, that just think if we're going to sit here next year and talk about what you created this coming year, it's going to be amazing. Mm, yeah, we're just getting started, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we ended on the show with you were speaking about the first half on the tree of life and the peacemaker. So if you want to pick it up there and then I have a couple of questions uh, from our listeners. Yeah. Okay. I'm really excited about the questions. I, I like that a lot better than mm -hmm. uh, me talking. <laughs> uh, the, the, the point is I found, you know, you can go to any Iroquois uh, member and say, because the Iroquois, it, for the longest time, there's five tribes. And they were at war with one another for generation after generation. It was brother against brother, tribe against tribe. Not only that, darkness has set in, and they were at war internally with themselves. And um, But now they've been unified into a confederacy, and they live peaceful, uh, peacefully. And um, so you ask them, how did you become united? And you'll find the story of Hiawatha, and the peacemaker. A lot of people have heard of Hiawatha, but I can, it doesn't seem like they really know the story. They just know the name. Uh, the peacemaker crossed over and met Hiawatha and taught him what he called the great law of peace. And was, uh, the tree of peace was also a part of that story, my, where we're going with that. And uh, what the peacemaker told Hiawatha was he overturned a, a, a huge tree and in the hole that was left, the warriors would go and put all their weapons and thought forms of war into the pit, the hole that was left from overturning the tree. And then at a certain time, he uprighted the tree and, and re, you know, stood it straight up and replanted it. And that end, marked an end to their war and their strife. And they actually have the oldest functioning democracy on the planet and um the seneca is one of those tribes and but what i want to tell you too with the book of mormon is the same story of the tree of peace or the tree of life they're interchangeable mm. is in the book of mormon as well it said that um you know there's this tree of life that was represented godlyhood and like uh to get to it, you walked this very strict path and you had to put all your weapons of war and thought forms of war, you had to get rid of them because you couldn't enter with those thought forms in your mm. vessel. So I found it there. I'm, I now know Peacemaker and Moroni are one and the same. Huh. Those are both previous incarnations of myself. But after I was known as the Peacemaker, by, by the way, that wasn't truly my name they wouldn't call me by my true name because they felt it was holy and that is Zia. but um what many people don't know Ia is not a name either it's a title it means grandfather huh. and inky is not a title it is i mean Inky is not a name it's a title as well kind of like the dalai lama mm -hmm. um what i found is truly my oldest name well Native American Indians told me it's Rainbow Warrior. Mm. That's what spirit recognizes me as. And the Eagle Nation, which is in little, you know, mm -hmm. had vetted me and 
so, you know, I'm a clean vessel. And uh, they call it rainbow. Rainbow to the Native American Indian elders is your chakras. They said mm-hmm. every chakra has a double tetrahedron, you know, the star David, the Merkaba. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and when they're spinning freely, they emit light. And only when they're unencumbered and spinning freely. And it's the colors of the rainbow through the seven chakra centers from red in the root to purple in the crown. And the grandmother said, to those of us that have uh, have the gift of sight, mm-hmm. that you've become the whirling rainbow. Oh. And the whirling rainbow is a prophecy from Native American Indian past. People can look into it. But um, it's interesting, too, because the Tibetan monks have the same understanding. And they call it the rainbow body. Mm-hmm. And um, once you've... So I think it's a great analogy, too, because... And everyone can become rainbow. Mm-hmm. And there's no religion attached to it. There's no, It mm-hmm. doesn't matter whether you're male, female, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter what race you are, what color you are. And it's going to be an individual journey for each of us to clean our chakra centers. Yeah. You know? Um, so I think it's a profound change of uh, bringing truth to the world. But, yeah, Lillian, I just wanted to say the connection between Moroni of the Book of Mormon and the peacemaker but what i will say so the peacemaker united the iroquois to become the oldest functioning democracy on the planet but at the beginning of uh the united states america which means land of the serpent by the way it's not a serpent about this rainbow warrior eagle i am a recognized member of the serpent clan Mm -hmm. um and that was you know Terry Rivera, right? Uh-huh, I do. Um, yeah, she's a serpent clan grandmother, and she does mm-hmm. all the events. They have the serpent mound. Um, you know how they have the music festivals? Well, one day, like, after we get done playing, and she's like, Michael, stay on stage. And she announced to the crowd, um, we, we want you to know Michael is now a recognized member of the serpent clan. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's funny, because talking about the the Forrest Gump of all this. <laughs> it took me like five months. I had no idea what the Serpent Clan was. You know, so finally I'm around Chief Coleman Light Eagle at one of the Star Knowledge Conferences. Like I said, this is about five months after. I said, Chief, what's the Serpent Clan? <laughs> you know? And uh, he's like, oh, there's those of us that have galactic heritage. Mm. That's what he said. But you can see where I was told by Chief Blue Star Eagle that when I was given my name, Rainbow Warrior Eagle, he said, your name is Rainbow Warrior, and it was given to you by the Eagle Nation. Mm. The Eagle Nation is the Anunnaki, and Eagle mm. status, to them, they wouldn't call Christ consciousness. To them, it's Eagle oh. consciousness. Mm. Cause the Eagle is the only uh, Thunderbird, that is, the bird that will fly above the star. It doesn't seek shelter below it, and they get the bird's eye view yeah. of everything. And... So to them, it's eagle status. But if you think of Enlil and the Anunnaki's vetting system of the seven lords of light mm-hmm. and the seven lords of darkness spoken of in the Emerald Tablets of Toth, um, well, if the Eagle Nation grants someone of the Serpent Clan rainbow status, you've truly become the feathered serpent. Mm. So... Mm. So the, the, the feathers, <laughs> does the feather serpent itself then have a rainbow feather to it? Is it a rainbow? Um... It could be. I mean, people wouldn't understand. It's really, it, you know, the rainbow status is truly clean chakras. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. Okay, I'm just, I just got a, a, a view of it. I just went, whoa, I saw it for a second there. That's why I had a comment like that. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> it is with the serpent clan or the dragon families. The dragon. And, you know, in Russia, it's like the, the red dragons. In China, you know, mm. every country has their own color. What I understood is America, the land of the plumed serpents, it's the rainbow dragons. Oh, I love that. I've never heard that before. Of course, I'm not, I yeah, haven't no, I, heard a lot of this before. I'm sure our listeners are going, wow, that's amazing. We have to listen to this show again. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, and you did get the book of the author that I met in uh, the children's book. So yes, the yes, I have the dragon. Yeah, he's going to come on the show. I have him booked to come on oh, the show. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. He's going to tell you, you know what, uh, man, this is weird, but there's three books now. I'll be enjoying the trilogy. And, you know, you can talk to him about this, but they're being based off of our talks. Uh, he went to uh, my house in the past many times. That's why he was at the at the recent event. Is you know I wanted him to I'm be there, for, and I'm okay. so glad he got to, to share those books. But they're profound. Um, they uh, they are communicating a story that everyone should read. So yay! Yeah. I'm glad you're having him on. Yeah, it's I call him Greg, Greg and James. Yeah, it's uh, Jim Dilliard, D I L Y A R D. Ian, the great silver dragon, a hero is yeah. born. But there's a trilogy, three of them. Yeah, yeah he's going to be know, on the show. Uh, the oldest uh, dragon shows up in the third book, and he's like the mystery dragon, the oldest <laughs> dragon. And guess what his name is? Oh, I have no idea. Wait. Toth? No way. I love it. Oh, yeah. oh I love yeah. it. And the whole second book gets into the dragon teaching the little boy about cosmic harmonious frequencies and huh. all that information well. came. So, you know what's fun is he's got audio books of the first two. Mm. And um, so I'm going to be doing the voice of Toth. Are you? And, <laughs> I yeah, love it. I well, love you know it. about the angry whopper voice, right? Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to scare people. Okay. <laughs> but, um, what happened was, as a child, you know, people are familiar with the Little Rascals. Right, right. But if you remember, um, there was a one character, and his name was Froggy. Right, exactly. And, and Froggy, Froggy always talked like this. <laughs> so I taught myself how to talk like that. But now, later in life, I realize it sounds pretty scary. <laughs> sounds, but I can talk like this all night. I can do the rest of this interview <laughs> in this voice. No problem. <laughs> That's but, awesome. So, yeah, I was talking to Dragon James. I'm like, you know I want to do <laughs> Dragon Toast. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That would be great. You know what, do you remember, I told the story of how this even happened because uh, I was with Al James at the Sundance. Oh, I love Al. Son. Yeah, he's, he's the bomb. I do, I but, just uh, love Al. We were on the way uh, to get something to eat, and he, um, he, uh, I told him, his son, the story of talking like froggy and he's like can you imagine ordering mcdonald's you know in that voice so we're like i like some fries and a big mac you know and we're all laughing and shit well we got the burger king and we walked in and said order an angry whopper so he looked at me he's like you gotta do it so i walked up and i said i like an angry whopper please well the girl looked really scared and frightened and, and I went, no, no, I'm just, I just wanted a normal lover. <laughs> and then she started laughing, like, oh, my God, I didn't know what the hell was going on. <laughs> so when we left uh, Burger King, um, we started joking about it. And it was like, man, what would be the funniest song you could sing in the Angry Whopper voice? That's forever now the name of that voice, is the Angry Whopper. The Angry voice. Whopper. So the song we all agreed on was... If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> I could go on. I actually looked up all the lyrics now. You know what the last one is? Because it combines all of them. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, say hooray. Hooray. <laughs> but anyway, so we were about to start getting to the cosmos, and uh, you might have even been there. We had a table with about ten people. Remember, there was that Mexican food place right next. I was, to the I area? was at that dinner. You remember when I, I told the same story, and right when I got done, the waitress came out, and she's like, "Did someone summons me?" <laughs> right, I remember that. I remember that. 
summons me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you couldn't let that one slide by. <laughs> we went down a rabbit hole there, didn't we? Yes. Dragons and I love it. And... I love it. Well, we we have a question with uh, from Corey Lavoy, and he asked, "How do you all think Blue Star Kachina prophecy relates to our current events?" Mm. Man, well, Chief Blue Star Eagle was Kachina is the dancer, mm -hmm. and he was Chief Chief Golden White Eagle's brother, and mm -hmm. I mean, he was a dancer extraordinaire, Blue Star, mm -hmm. and to the point that he like was a you know how like sometimes if you go to disney world they'll have native american indian dancers mm -hmm. like real ones you know so he was a professional native american first nation dancer but um man he's involved with all of this he's the one him and chief more so than anyone brought me and sarah together um and uh i uh, hmm, i can tell you what i have come to know and um He, uh, he's the one, in, he was the one in charge here. Um, everyone of the Anunnaki family mm -hmm. is here in human form. And uh, they have to be Nephilim bodies, though, because what I found out, that's the whole thing of creating an offshoot of the human genome. So they would have, a, when they tried to incarnate into just the normal human DNA vessel, Mm -hmm. They would spontaneously combust. Yeah, blow it out. the flames because it wasn't that the body wasn't capable of handling the energetic level of an incoming Elohim. Right. So they're like, well, as much as we want to help, bursting in the flames kind of sucks. So <laughs> let's see if we can rethink this. And they thought, well, what if we created an offshoot of the human vessel that has more chi or prana? Mm -hmm. life force available at a cellular level and um so that was the creation of the nephilim by the harvard professor said you know by the way when he re released to the show you know michael has this theme blood anomaly right um i was like well wait a minute man what first of all this isn't a tv show to me anymore what, is there something i should be worried about you know and and he looks at me and goes, well, what do you think unknown means? He's pretty ex kind of mean about it. Ooh. I was like, and he said, well, if I had to venture a guess, I would venture that there was some type of virus unknown to mankind. But he said, people think of viruses as a negative thing. He said, some aren't. They're, it's one of the only things that can work at the level of DNA. So he said, I would think it's some kind of unknown virus that's tricking the body into releasing massive amounts of creatine kinase. Mm -hmm. So as, I, as we're saying, creatine kinase brings oxygen into the bloodstream mm -hmm. to facilitate healing. And the normal amounts of creatine kinase in the normal human blood is 25 parts per liter of blood. And um, it can rise to about 300 if you've had bodily damage, a heart attack, or mm. rift of muscle. But uh, what they found in my blood was 2,100 um, versus 25. Uh, and, but with no medical reason whatsoever. Uh, uh, no heart attack, no rip muscle. And um, so I can tell you, we can get into the AR Gordon subject, but when I was brought into yay. the reverse <laughs> engineering team of the NSA, they told me there's about 200 members, and 12 of their members was of my same bloodline. And Ooh. they said my levels of 2100 would have put me about in the middle of those 12. Huh. But the highest, he said, was 12,000. And wow. they did say that that individual with 12,000 level of creatine kinase um was hit by a particle beam weapon and they said he got up and kind of brushed himself off with the connotation was most people wouldn't have got up i can't spontaneously heal but uh i do heal pretty fast and i don't get sick often mm -hmm. but um just a little uh, so um yeah the creation of the nephilim was to be able to come and help and you know under the radar, so to speak, and um, matter of fact, you'll find that Haplogroup X2A in the remains that were removed out of the mounds, they had giant stature, and but now we don't, 
Mm-hmm. So that's a very interesting talking point in itself that there's no doubt about it. A few generations ago, half of group X2A had, you know, very tall stature from nine to about 15 feet tall. Mm-hmm. And uh, now they shrunk us and made us fatter. <laughs> <laughs> I got more rounded and shorter. <laughs> But you still, but you're still a strong body that's able to really pull a lot of energy in there and and exert a lot of energy and in your your healing ability. It, it's like, uh, you know, putting a gallon of milk through a thimble, but through most yeah, people. Funny. But I, I don't say this much because I don't do a lot of only for. I, you know, I just if someone knows me and I'm mm-hmm. there. I will do energy work for anyone that I feel is in need, mm-hmm. but I don't do it for money. Right. And I don't, um, I just, I just don't, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, anyhow. So, uh, at the serpent mound for the eclipse ceremony, um, that was led by chief golden light Eagle. Um, they did a healing session for, uh, grandmother. Terry mm-hmm. Rivera, oh. and um, so the lady that was organizing people, like you stand here, you go behind her, mm-hmm. you know, and, and she was bringing up energy workers. It was funny because I walked up next to her and she looked at me like really shocked. She goes, "Oh my God, you you get here!" And she put me right, <laughs> right in front of her. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can produce a lot of energy um, through you know it's the palm chakras more so than anything um and uh but you know i, I don't just use i can put energy into the ley lines you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying yeah so the work that we're doing at these mound sites that are always the our ancients built these mound sites whether it's cahokia or newark earthworks or serpent mound they always built them where ley lines cross which creates vortexes mm-hmm. and a vortex is going to amplify anything that enters it unbiasedly mm-hmm. you know if you walk into one of those areas with negative fear-based thought forms man not a good idea right matter right. of fact native american indians they wouldn't even enter those areas unless they cleansed their vessel and did dancing and saged and got their head right you know right right um, especially on a so, solstice or an equinox too right yeah you know what i could share too the reason the native ancients would bring and do ceremony and really track the equinoxes and solstices because the ley lines up and flow with energy mm-hmm. and they're the brightest on the equinoxes and uh, the solstices and um so yeah they uh they would not go into those areas with a bunch of garbage and it's funny because now in east lake they got a, a east lake middle school just sitting there with kids in it oblivious you know, um, in that whole area, um, it's, I hate to say that area has a darkness to it. Mm-hmm. So like I said, it's going to amplify whatever you bring into it. Mm-hmm. And uh, but hopefully, not hopefully, it's not coincidence we just brought the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull. By the way, did you hear what Chief Golden White Eagle said about that? No. He said that is over 200,000 years old. Huh. Um. And, uh, it, it was really yeah, a privilege we, to be a part of that group. And how was it for you? I mean, when you actually got to, you put your third eye right on to the Mitchell Hedges skull. Yeah, that's not even allowed. Cause he doesn't, it's not allowed, exactly. People are not. Um, and uh, it was weird because the, the skull communicated to me when I got in front of it. You are to put your third eye to my third eye. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was kind of awkward because, you know, Bill Homming, the, you know, the guardian caretaker that has the skull right. now, um, you're not allowed to touch it. So I said, this is kind of awkward. But uh, he's telling me to put my forehead to it. He said, yes, I know, and you have permission. Truly what I found is it's looking, you know, it's an information container. It's mm-hmm. like... Not only the Akashic record of this planet Earth, but that 13th skull has the Akashic records and it connects the Earth to a larger galactic uh, grid work. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, 
it's looking for the um, proper recipient mm -hmm. to download its contents. And um, but what I've been told too is it does it by making physical contact with you and reading your DNA, mm -hmm. and then it vets you and sees how you respond to trial and tribulation. And it's multidimensional. It could, it's certain, like out through your life, it all things that you bring forth. Um, it's so what I'm telling you is if you come before the skull and with negative thought forms or even it, it, some people call it the, the skull of doom because <laughs> it, if, if you so I can see why he doesn't let everyone <laughs> do it you know but do you know Susan Chapman by the way no but you you've asked you've told me I need to find out about her yeah, and and, uh, yeah she's uh, you know from the human counterpart uh, meat suit for Aki. She is Kuan Yin here. In the okay. Festival. And um, she had come in contact with a Tibetan monk had one of the other crystal skulls. There's mm -hmm. 12 other ones. And um, she said, Michael, when I sat down in front of it, he told me to touch my forehead to it. Yeah. And I said, well, wow, that sounds familiar. <laughs> I didn't tell anyone, but you asked my, my perception. You know, if, you, if you're looking at the skull, it's looking at you. Right. You're looking at each other. But once I touch my forehead to it, in my third eye, clear as day, I see it rise up and levitate in front of me, mm. and then spin. Mm. So now, its back of its head is big. I'm looking at the back, back of its skull. And then it's slow, it slowly uh, superimposed itself over my own skull. And so Susan Chapman said, you know, once I touched forehead with it, it levitated and spun around and put itself over my skull. Huh. Well, what's really interesting in her case is from that point forward, for about a week, she lost the ability to speak English. It was all light language. And yeah. she didn't even know it. She said when she got home, her kids were like, well, how was your trip? And she's like, I didn't say it, but I didn't <laughs> Mom, what the hell? You're not speaking English, and she like she thinks she's going. What are you? What are you even talking about? It's going, right. oh, I can't speak light, light, light language, but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it seems to be looking for the proper recipients to. And what I understand is the other twelve is the akashic records of planet Earth. Hmm. It's divided up into twelve libraries, and each library, you know, is contained within one of the 12 crystal skulls but the 13th crystal skull once it's activated which obviously it is now mm -hmm. um it is it contains all of the information of the other 12 plus the galactic connection to bring mankind into becoming a galactic society I love that. and and uh it's time the galactic <laughs> federation yes so uh, it was weird because the, you know, we had that ceremony where we took the skull to the unknown Hall of Records, mm -hmm. Mount Sinai in East Lake. Right. And um, the, uh, at one of the Star Knowledge Conferences, uh, the Canadian Public Corporation, which is actually bigger than the PBS, you know, network in, uh, in the United States, um, they were there filming and they liked my presentation. And the head of that uh, Canadian public corporation said, do you want to be on our show? And I said, sure. Um, but what I found out is on that solstice, or was it the equinox? I think it was the equinox. Was equi mm -hmm. Equinox. Um, in Canada, I, I had no clue that the movement that we uh, started, speaking of even the Star Knowledge Conferences, um, <laughs> Uh, the head producer said, what, what do you think we should call this movement? I said, well, you came to a Star Knowledge Conference, you know. <laughs> so uh, they call it the Star Knowledge Symposium. And uh, your listeners can type in University of Ottawa and Star Knowledge. And you'll see now teaching Star Knowledge through the University of Ottawa is pretty huge. Yeah. And the show that they filmed... Uh, was air 
hired at the University of Ottawa, and it was like a black tie event, you know. Mm -hmm. um, So what I'm saying is the skull is supposed to be able to uh, uh, arrange what I call event strings. You know, it's not coincidence you and I are talking right now. It Mm -hmm. took many, many decision points and right connections. Mm -hmm. Well, in the same way, the skull has the ability to behind the scenes multi-dimensionally to uh if we're going to become a galactic society it can arrange the chess pieces on our board of life so we meet the right people and mm-hmm. it, it happens effortlessly mm-hmm. so if things feel like you're hitting your head on a wall then you're not in the flow yeah. you know it should be effortless so uh the skull is already doing its thing you know people say uh hold my beer <laughs> uh, I've, I've started a new movement hold hold my skull <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it. and you know when you are in when you you start when the first time i met the skull it has never left me it's it just right? it just never leaves you and it's um I know we have Stacy Cossie listening. Hi, Stacy, and she was a part of, of this as well. Yeah. And and she came to Florida too. Yes, so, which was such a blessing. Yes, and, uh, yeah, I got to show her of the, the Rainbow Springs is where I did the water blessing ceremony mm. that quantum entangled the four thirty two image, and uh, yeah, it was cool just to be able to share this with Stacy and everybody and we're just getting started we're going to be bringing this team into canada mm-hmm. to the uk st michael's ley line yeah and um to a lot of more places here in the united states like chaco canyon you know Ooh, chaco uh, canyon would be Newark, great right yeah i can't imagine ah. but, uh, yeah, hi, hi stacy <laughs> and and so with this so um it's a group you're going to be working closely with the Ottawa University, with the Chief and the Star Knowledge um, Conference, bringing that. Yeah, they're, mm-hmm. they're already part of it, um, which is fascinating. Um, for the Canada show, I've seen a rough cut of the TV show. And, um, you know, Douglas. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. He's in it. Chief Golden Light Eagle's in it. Uh, you know, already we're a part of it. Um, the, the naming of Star Knowledge, but here's the deal. Um, this gets into a strange thing, but you know, part of my being guided into cosmic harmonious frequencies through crop circles was the significance of the seven pointed star. Mm-hmm. And it's very simple. You know, if you do four octaves below 432 and send it through a scientific device called a cymatic device. It's called a cymoscope. Cymatics is a new science of making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. Um, It makes frequency. You can see what effect it's having in in the physical realm. And so take four octaves below middle A on your piano Mm -hmm. is 27 hertz. And take a 27 hertz frequency and pump it through one of those cymatic devices. You find it's a seven-pointed star. And the seven-pointed star is the Cherokee emblem of their own nation, the uh, the Anunnaki world map of Babylon that sits huh. in the museum right now is on a seven-pointed star, huh. um, so on and so forth. But one night, uh, they totally guided me into the significance of the seven-pointed star. Ooh. But I was in bed, and they said, uh, Michael, get up and divide a circle by seven. And again, it's like one of those times, like with the Steve I contest. Yes. And I've learned not to question it. That's good. The answer is then you've learned nothing. Right. You know? So, you know, honest to God, I had to go to Sarah. Sarah <laughs> I got to get up and do some math. <laughs> All right, you freak. So I come in and I find out. Uh, this is mind blowing. I'm so glad we could share this. Yeah. Um, Divide a circle by seven. Anyone can follow along. Mm-hmm. Circle is 360 degrees, right? Mm-hmm. So three, 360 divided by seven is 51.428. So I'm like, well, all right. Mm-hmm. You know, so what, right? Mm-hmm. So the next thing that happens is they guide me. Me and Graham Hancock has become 
Oh, he's brilliant. He's brilliant, man. 432 discs, by the way. Oh. Because uh, I learned a lot of four, about 432 from him. Oh, cool. But um, he's, you know, in the, so long in the past, we felt that the Great Pyramid in uh, Giza had four sides. You know, it's mm-hmm. a pyramid. Mm-hmm. Well, now we know it's eight sides. But get back to when we thought it was four sides. Graham Hancock has the side angle at 51.86. Huh. angle of the side slope so then i find out well no the, the pyramid has eight sides and those eight sides are only visible on the spring and fall solstices huh. and just kind of like the snake going down the mexican pyramid you know right. what i'm talking about yeah yeah Where, uh, so only on two days can you see that there's eight sides and I said, well, obviously there's another side angle involved, right? Because mm-hmm. it's not just four sides. And this voice says, uh, subtract your 51.428, which is forever tied to a seven-point star. Mm-hmm. Divide it, I mean, subtract it from 51.86. So I did, and I'll just share this. Okay. Save the suspense. It's 432. <laughs> And, of course uh, so it is. Like, oh my God. Of course it is. <laughs> think of the engineering <laughs> to engineer a building the size of the pyramid in only two days. And they said that's the true arc of the company, huh. by the way. That would reveal that true arc. But here's the deal. The next thing they guided me into understanding was, uh, you know, St. Michael's Ley Line. Right. Which we talked about. Yes. Um, and uh, they're like, in the voice in, in my head is like, you really should look into uh, what the longitude is on planet Earth. I'm talking real life longitude latitude. Mm-hmm. Type in a, type in your listeners. Type in Avebury. Oh, I love uh, Avebury. Long, longitude, because Avebury, Stonehenge, yeah, and it's where all these crop circles are showing up yeah right i've spent well, many have... many years there I've, I've went many times in the crop circles there i'm fortunate uh, right on. <laughs> well the longitude is 51.428 oh jeez. on planet earth st michael's ley line and mary it's st michael and mary's ley line um oh. so this is freaking huge but then i'm like well wait a minute first of all 51.428 is one seventh away around a, uh, a seven pointed star. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so 51.428 is forever tied to a seven pointed star. You can't separate the two. But now you got crop circles featuring seven pointed stars along the 51.428 mm-hmm. uh, longitude. That's crazy. I, That's... I think what's happening. Is uh, Richard Hoagland. I learned from him that you know the Merkaba, the Star of David, which had six points. You know, mm-hmm. where uh, it's always nineteen point five on the sides. If you put that inside of a circle, where it touches the circle is nineteen point five, mm-hmm. and on all the planets, that's where the biggest upwelling of multi-dimensional energy is. On Earth, it's a volcano. On uh-huh. Saturn, it's the Great Storm. That is huh. Saturn, right? Well, I don't Super. know. Anyhow, every planet, the greatest upwelling of energy is at 19.5, huh. which is encoded into the star of David, the Merkaba. But what they're showing us is if you want to work on higher levels, that's the base frequency of energy coming in that creates our physical realm is the six-petaled seed of life. But here's the deal, you know, this gets really weird is, uh, so they, they told me divide a circle by seven, mm-hmm. you get 51.428, but then they guided me to understand multiply a circle by seven, and you, you know, the seed of life that we know of that becomes the flower of life, Right. if you look in the middle, it's a six petal, it's, you know, it's six petal, and those petals make the Merkaba. You know, one pyramid up intertwined with one pyramid down. But if you take the exact same building blocks and instead of one in the middle and six around, you go seven around, none in the middle. 
It's the Asaboros, right? The tail oh. eating its own. Oh, oh my God. So, well, what you get is a, a brand new seed of life that mankind's never seen before. Oh. It is a uh, seven petal seed of life. It's all curved lines, it's all Vesca Pisces. Oh. Piscis. Um, that creates this new seed of life. And what they're telling me, six-petaled old seed of life, I hate to say old, uh-huh. but it's the cocoon phase for human evolution. Right. And now they're showing us the butterfly. For the Aquarian uh, age? For the Aquarian yes. age? Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. <gasps> but people need to understand, you know, with sacred geometry, everything from the atom to galaxies are adhering to that old, <laughs> not old, <laughs> the, the, cat, the caterpillar it's the cocoon phase of human evolution um, the seven petals so what happened was when they showed when they told me to get up and divide a circle by seven mm-hmm. in my mind's eye you can follow along and do this just in your third eye picture a circle mm-hmm. and then they took what I call the Anunnaki cosmic astral highlighter <laughs> and they went one <laughs> One seventh away around the circle, uh-huh. and it lit up. And then they showed me the rest of the circle falling away, which just kept that kind of like a frowny face up there. I guess it would be a smiley face because that's what happened. The rest of the circle fell away. It kept that arc of just one seventh away around a circle. And then they said that's the true arc of the covenant. It was never an ARK. It was an ARC. Uh-huh. And if you know, the arc of the covenant was said to bring you humanity a new form of unlimited free energy right a new energy source and nasa just proved it does because it's all related to the 432 frequency which i will people are like well how well e equals mc squared right everyone yep. knows that yeah but quantum physicists now tell us everything is both particle and wave well e is energy m is mass and c is the speed of light where is the wave component M equals mass, that's the particle. Where's the wave? Mm-hmm. Well, 432 squared becomes C, mathematically, mm. within 1% accuracy. <laughs> so the only frequencies that are truly harmonics of light are 432 base frequencies. So if you follow 432 times 432 becomes C, and the E equals, e equals MC squared. So... 432 base frequency squared becomes C squared times mass equals energy. So uh, they showed me this arc of 51.428, but then underneath of it, they mirrored it and brought it floating up to meet itself, which would create an eye shape. You know what I mean? Oh, right. Like Like um, the Horus eye or? Yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm wondering, too, if that is 51.428. That's mm-hmm. future research. But right when that happened, I they'd already guided me into the seven-pointed star, right? And um, so I thought, wow, I wonder what a seven-pointed star would look like made out of that Ark of the Covenant arc. Mm-hmm. And that's the crop circle that showed up the very next day in the UK <laughs> along St. Michael's Ley Line. Oh. That gets really weird, too, because um, St. Michael's Ley Line, the crop circle that showed up, in the Gnostic teachings of Christianity, they have what's called the seal of the seven archangels. Mm. And it is, it's surrounding the seven-pointed star made out of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the outside of that is the seal of the seven archangels, which was led by Archangel Michael, I would Saint s- Michael. I would think Michael, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so wow. the end of it, right? Wow. It's, it's all, it's all connected, and they told me um, in Canada, the 51.428 longitude line, I'm like, well, where does it go through the United States? Mm-hmm. Well, the answer is it doesn't. It goes through Canada. So oh. you asked me about the work coming up with the Canadian government. Right. And that is to bring a team with uh, all of us, right. Bill and the Skull. Yeah. Uh, all of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it's pretty cool, too, because... Um, uh, it's going to be called the Morning Star Team. I know, I'm so excited about it. I like it. So <laughs> there'll be members coming in and out of it, you know, and mm-hmm. not everyone will be at every event, but uh, 
Yeah. You know, matter of fact, when we go to like Chaco, I'd like to bring Clifford Mahuti into the mix okay. and have the actual Native American Indian elders who know about that culture and that would be you know, great. what's being communicated there and uh, so on and so forth, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so 51.428 runs through Canada. So we're, as soon as this COVID thing lifts, um, we'll be bringing the team to Canada. And not only that, though, I was told by the Anunnaki that St. Michael's ley line that runs through Avebury and Stonehenge mm -hmm. and all that, they said there's a story waiting for mankind that if you started either, either uh, I guess you call it beginning or end of the line. It's, I guess it doesn't much matter. But then you go to all those Templar churches and mm -hmm. ancient stone sites and look at, there's a story. They said, look at the sculptures and the artwork and look at the mythos that is being given, which is all about Michael. And you know what's weird is I told you that I, was, and I am Michael. But right, I, right. I'd love to see you at the funny. white well there. There's the red well at Chalice Well, and then there's the white well right across the street. I mean, I just can't wait till you're there. I, I want to be there for sure. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm excited about it. This is fun stuff, isn't it? Yes, you know? yes. Um, well, because for you to be since, there. Uh, 2008, you know? Yeah. But, like you said, it's been a, a quite a trip from not understanding. By, by the way, though, when I met the Anunnaki, in 2008, mm -hmm. um, they said, we need to know what you know. Cause, <laughs> so they took out this device that stimulated my third eye. I could feel it. It felt wow. good, actually. Wow. Probably started to release a little DMT naturally. Mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's what makes us scream at night, by the way. When we're born, our bodies are flooded with DMT. Mm -hmm. Every night, when you go into deep sleep, your brain releases DMT, and it makes you enter REM dream mm -hmm. state <laughs> but when they uh stimulated my third eye i heard they can go right through your third eye and hit the acoustic records mm -hmm. and see exactly who you are who you've ever been and who you're gonna be you wow. know and uh that changed everything uh during that meeting but there's a reason i was telling you this and now i spun out that's okay well um we were talking early about chaco canyon clifford mahuti bringing the elders is that a part of oh say, the Seal of the Seven, the Morning Star. Uh, our, yeah, Archangels. Which is weird to me because I, that's not my baggage, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not religious in that aspect, but as you know, the Native American Indians have um, officially, when I was given my spiritual Native American Indian name of Rainbow Warrior Eagle, mm -hmm. I was recognized, recognized as St. Michael. And they returned to me the... Uh, the 3D representation of uh, the sort of truth. And yes. it is a dagger. It's probably, I don't know, about a foot and a half long. And they said it was made out of, out of the same process that the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull was created from. What? They said, which was, which was sound, by the way, they said. Because you know the Mitchell Hedges skull went to Hewlett Packard. Right, so exactly. And the scientists under a microscope, they can't find any tool marks. Nope. They said, this thing should not exist, you know? Right, so, in yeah, one piece. Have, as weird as it is, is that's not my mythos of <laughs> uh, Archangel Michael. And um, But I, I started to wonder, because I would walk into a Star Knowledge Conference, and Chief Gold Might Eagle, this is even before being having the sword returned to me mm -hmm. and being recognized by the elders as Michael. Mm -hmm. um, I'd walk into the room, and he goes, oh, Archangel Mikiel is here. I'm looking around <laughs> going, he is? You know, where? <laughs> and uh, so it was, it was shocking to me, you know. But, right. You know, I know what it sounds like. I know it sounds batshit crazy, but <laughs> the fact of the matter is, I, I freaking have the sword here. You do, you do. Know, I mean, you do. Like, and and, and you have nervous. walked this. You have, It's in you now. It's you... You don't question it now because it's it's it is you. You owned it, right? You you owned it. Yeah. So that's the deal. Even with you know the peacemaker, mm -hmm. Ia is is Ia is a title, not a name. Mm -hmm. um, Inky is a title, not a name. 
the Peacemaker is a title and not a name. My name's Michael. Mm-hmm. And it's fun to come full circle, you know? Mm-hmm. Even Water Bear, I can look someone in the eye now and, yeah, I am the Water Bear. Right. You like to see the NASA scientific study right. that we're, if it, I have bear water. Right. I, was right. It wasn't me, but it is me. You know, I, the technology came through me with their guidance. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, uh, what I'm understanding, this will, uh, this will free mankind it is, will bring unlimited free energy to this planet. And it's all about uh, starting to understand frequency and right. its relationship right. to creation. You know what? Star Knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. The Star Knowledge Symposium in, in Canada and whatnot. Well, what is Star Knowledge? Mm-hmm. Star Knowledge is the sacred knowledge of how light and sound create physical reality and um that's what all this is it's um sound is frequency it's that simple yeah and and i i'm really looking forward we're we're really at the end of our show michael and you know what i really wanted i love questions but (laughs) we got into some cool stuff maybe we should do a whole nother show in the near future i think we do Q&A show. I think so too. I think so too. And oh, we'll get it. we'll get all of the questions from everybody ahead of time and we'll we'll do that. And I'm really looking forward to you really in your teacher role. You have so much to teach um all of us from from your life experience, not only this lifetime but all your past lives and your future lives, Michael, that you get to bring um well, it's, it's an honor. And um, I feel like I'm stepping into, uh, you know, mission to fruition. Mm-hmm. It's why we're all here, you know. We're all just passing it along. And it's nice, you know, a lot of people have been, like, they're digging what I'm putting down. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I'm just passing it along just like you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I so don't like the idea of guruship. Or oh, no. Me, <laughs> you know, and I did that. I just want to play guitar and let's have a nice conversation and <laughs> right. you know we don't even have to agree. Let's agree to disagree. And yeah. Be adult, that's, that's adulting, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and we can stimulate each other in in our ideas and our thinking and, and in our creativity. That's when we're the closest with source, right? Is in that creative mode. Well, I'm really excited about all this because I am a nerd. <laughs> for like history like I can't tell you I don't know how much time we do have left we have like three so minutes just, I will tell you in the past when I was a teenager somehow through the grapevine I had learned that the Freemasons had hidden history in their you know so I found the local Freemason lodge and I drive phone called them and said I'd, I'd like to meet more of you so uh, I did I met this guy over coffee and he's like son we just get together and drink coffee and eat donuts you're talking way up here and i'm down here i don't know what you're even talking about so i said all right thank you and we just drank some coffee and that was about it so it's like the answers i was searching for even as a teenager now they're coming to me and i'm the one that's being put in a position to share mm-hmm. and um but you know my biggest thing too is let's figure this shit out together right you know right. what i mean um which feels good. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think with your group and your team <clears throat> that you're bringing together, it's 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 just the beginning, right? We're just beginning, and and uh, uh, oh, what did your young boy say at the door? I think that says it all for yeah. the. Yeah. There you have it. it. So So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael, so much. And uh, you can. Yes, we will. Love you guys. See you next week. We will have Terry Lovelace uh, on next week. But uh, go out and have a great week. Uh, Much love to everybody. And thanks again, Michael Lee Hill. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you.